My name's John Barrows, and I have the pleasure and honor to serve Bostonians as the Chief of Economic Development. But I also have the pleasure and honor to be here with Black Boston today as we celebrate Black History Month. And the hashtag for today is more than a month, right? And so I'm proud to be here with my colleagues from City Hall. I want to give an early shout out to the Black Employee Network for all the work that they did to prepare this and get us here. And then my job is simple. I'm emceeing. And so I'm going to get on the mic and off the mic and move the program forward. And so after welcoming you, my job is to call up here a brother who's dynamic, who is going to help us by coming up here and doing an invocation. And that brother is Reverend Art Gordon, who is the pastor of St. John's Missionary Baptist Church. We're going to give a warm Black Month welcome to Pastor Gordon. Good afternoon, Boston. Let us bow in prayer. God Almighty, God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, Thou who has brought us thus far on the way, we give thanks for this day, and we give thanks for this season, and we give thanks for this month of a time where us, not only as a city but as a nation, can celebrate our history and our heritage as black people in this country. Over 400 years, Lord, of oppression, we still, God, have much work to do. Our prayer, God, in this season and in this time is that you would help us to hold hands together in the spirit of brotherly love and of sisterly love as we continue to fight for affordable housing, for equitable justice, for climate change, to continue to make our community safer and stronger. Help us to be reminded that this celebration is more than a month. Help us to be reminded, God, of the history and heritage and invoke the presence of the spirit of our ancestors of Boston here in this place. Names like Weven William Grimes, names like Malcolm X, names like Louis Farrakhan, names like Melnia Cass and so many others, names like William Monroe Trotter and others who have paved the way for us here today. Help us, God, to remember to celebrate them, and we invoke their presence in this spirit, in this moment, and on this celebration today. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. More than a month. At this point, I'd like to invite up here some of Boston's finest as we bring up here to John D. O'Brien Junior Choir. Let's hear it for our choir today. Bring them up here. Keep it going. Let's hear it for the choir. Let's hear it for our young people. Let's hear it for the choir. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Bradley. I'm the director of choral activities at the O'Brien School for Math and Science, and we are the varsity choir. This is my eighth grade choir, um, so we are so excited to be here. We are going to sing for you a few times today, um, but this first piece, is we're going to do a little history travel, if that's all right. Um, we're actually going to go all the way back to Africa. Um, this first piece is simply called Gabby Gabby. It is a song that is used um, if I'm not mistaken, you sort of as a travel song in South Africa. So, Gabby Gabby.
Keep it up, keep it up for the Varsity Choir. The John D. O'Brien Varsity Choir. Let's hear for them. Beautiful. Special thank you to the director of the choir, Michael Bradley. Let's hear for Michael and the choir one more time. I don't know about you, but the acoustics in here is challenging, and so for them to be able to sing in this place, you know that they work hard out here and they gave it their all. But most importantly, it's, it's important to showcase young talent. So if one more time, if you could just help me in thanking the John D. O'Brien Varsity Choir for being here today. Now I get the, uh, the special uh, honor to introduce the mayor. Um, the mayor doesn't need an introduction in his house, in the people's house, but I do want to say for those of you who might think the mayor is here because he has to be here and you kind of got to do these things, let me tell you that is not the case. That is not the case. And if you know the mayor, you know the mayor just doesn't do things because he's got to do them and it's political. In fact, his staff get really upset sometimes because they'll ask him to do things that are political and he just doesn't show up for them unless he believes in it. And, 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 when, and the mayor's probably going to talk about some announcements in this year and where he's going, and I appreciate that. But let me tell you from a personal standpoint, this is a mayor who believes in all of the people of Boston. It's a mayor who believes in black Boston. It's a mayor who believes that we celebrate history, not for history's sake, but we celebrate history for today and tomorrow's sake, for where we're going. And so I am proud to not only work for him, but I'm proud to welcome him to the stage here, to the microphone, I'm getting some amens and some yeses here, and I'm loving it. I'm proud to welcome our mayor, and I ask you to help me welcome our mayor to this microphone, Martin J. Walsh. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let me, um, let me uh, b begin by thanking all of Boston's black employees that are here today. Uh, thank you for, for what you do in our city. Thank you for what you represent. Uh, to everyone here that works in the city, cabinet level positions, department heads, uh, regardless of your role, Thank you as well for being here uh, today. Uh, every year, this, I think this is my sixth, uh, maybe the seventh, seventh event time we've done this, and every time the crowd gets bigger and bigger and bigger, so I want to thank you for that. Uh, I want to also give another shout out to the amazing choir from the John D. O'Brien School. You guys are awesome. We are so proud of you in the city uh, for who you represent and what you are and who you are. Thank you so much. Uh, to the elected officials that are here, I want to thank uh, the president of the Boston City Council, Kim Janey, is with us. Thank you, Madam President. We have uh, City Council Eddie Flynn with us in the house. Thank you, Eddie. We have City Council Kenzie Bark with us today. Thank you, Kenzie. And I'm not sure if we have any other, uh, I'll get you, I'll see you, just pop your head somewhere and I'll get you in a few minutes. Uh, I want to thank uh, our, our Chief Resilient Officer, Laurie Nelson, who's with us today. Thank you, Laurie. Um, the woman who organized this event, uh, who, um, quite honestly, uh, she works behind the scenes and she doesn't look for the headlines and she doesn't look for the lights, but that's Frida Bransfield. Thank you, Frida. We have two past presidents of the historic Boston branch of the NAACP, Michael Curry and Joe Fista. Thank you, Michael and Joe. Oh, and Louis Alicia, three. Sorry, Louis. When Louis was the president, I was in a crib. It was a long time ago. I was just a baby. Thank you. Sorry, Louis. Um, 
And um, there's, there's a whole bunch of, of, of I'm going to get into a speech in a minute, but I have a special presentation I'm going to do right now in a second. But I also want to just have us just think about um, this year already we've lost a lot of giants. And I'm going to talk about Councilor Turner in a second. But on Saturday, on Saturday uh, afternoon, um, we lost a giant in the city of Boston, uh, Clarence Jeep Jones. Um, Jeep was a friend. Um, I met Jeep in 2011 uh, when I took over the building. I knew who he was, but I didn't know him personally. And in 2011, I got a chance to know him personally. He was the chairman of the Boston Redevelopment Authority at the time. And a lot of what you see when people talk about leaving your mark on a city, a lot of the buildings that you see in the city of Boston got approved while Jeep was the chair of the Boston Redevelopment Authority. He talked about equity. He talked about inclusion. He talked about all of, the, all of what, was, what we're seeing in the city today. And I know a lot of times people say, you know, there's really no equity inclusion and the development's going on. Jeep was at the gavel when those buildings went through. Before that, Jeep had many different positions and, and, uh, in, in, of stature, if you will. He also worked in this building uh, many, many years ago. Uh, he was at the forefront of civil rights. He's at the forefront of equality. Um, I had a chance to go visit Jeep on Saturday. I was at an event, and um, I left the event, and I went over to his house. And his wife was there, and his wife let me have a few moments along with Jeep. And it was just me and Jeep, and I held his hand, and, and I prayed with him. But I thanked him. I thanked him for what he did for Boston. Because there's too many times where younger people don't understand that the work that has been laid down uh, and what you're working off of is the work that people like Jeep Jones did that actually was really difficult work at the time. And I want us all just to remember Jeep Jones. He was a gentleman. He was Boston. He worked hard for every single thing that he ever got. And the amount of people that he got into college, and I didn't know this till the other day, the amount of people that he got into college, black kids that didn't have an opportunity to get into college, that didn't have something to help them. Chief Jones did it quietly. Chief Jones did it through basketball. Chief Jones did it through education. And, and I, want to, I just want to thank and have us remember Chief Jones as we move forward here. Um, a lot of you probably don't know the name. Um, you're going to hear a lot and read a lot about him probably in the next few days in the paper. Everything that you're going to read about and hear about is 100% true. Right up until um, about three weeks ago, he was helping people. The last time I spoke to Jeep when he, was, when he was awake, he was asking me to help somebody. That's what he did. It wasn't about him. He was a humble, simple person that carried a big stick. So I'd like to ask you all to keep Jeep Jones in your prayers as we get through. His services are going to be Saturday, Friday at the 12th Baptist Church, 4 to 8. I would suggest to the younger folks in this room, if you want to go and just just go and thank somebody who did something special that helped lay down a foundation and ask you to go by his, his services just to say a quick prayer. And his funeral will be Sunday, Saturday morning. So uh, to Jeep Jones. Jeep, we love you. Thank you for everything. And um, another person we lost, um, before we go any further, at Christmas we lost a leader who was a champion for the black community and equality for our city was Chuck Turner. He was an activist for affordable housing and good jobs. He took that activist spirit as a member of the Boston City Council where he served 10 years. Before I bring Darren up, um, Chuck was another person that I had a different type of relationship with. Most people don't know the relationship. And it wasn't confrontational. It was about getting things done. And when Chuck passed, I called his wife and spoke to her, and what she said was, people will never know what you and Chuck did together in changing equity for a lot of people. And it's important for us to recognize the people who laid down the foundation. I'd like to ask Darren Howell to come on up here, along myself and, and City Council Kim Janey and Eddie, to accept the citation honoring Chuck for his contributions to the city. This is a certificate of recognition in honor of Charles H. Chuck Turner, 1940 
to 2019 in remembrance of his incredible presence and contributions and devoted service to the residents of Boston and in recognition of his passion for social justice and his dedication to making our city a better place. A grateful Boston thanks him and honors his legacy, signed by myself, Mayor of Boston, Marty Walsh, Councilor Janey, and Councilor Flynn. And I know that there's going to be other uh, recon recognitions of, of Councilor Turner, but as Tito Jackson said the other day, and he stole the line from somebody else, 1940-2019. It's not what you did in 1940, not what you did in 2019, it's what you did in the dash. And I can honestly say, I didn't always agree with Chuck Turner, but I can honestly say he spent every single day of his life trying to improve the life of someone else. So, Darren, thank you very much, my friend. We have a, I think we have something for you, too. No, we're good. I think um, today we launch Black History Month. It's a time to honor the central role African-American residents have played in our city from the Revolutionary War to the abolitionist movement and the Civil War to civil rights to the present day. We honor those who paved the way and those who continue to move us forward today in the year 2020. We have a whole month planned for special events here in Boston. And we have this year, we're going to even do expand it for a whole year. We are celebrating the black community all year long. The idea of having a year long celebration or acknowledgement, because not every conversation we have over the next year is going to be celebration. It's going to be an understanding and recognition of the work we still have to do. The idea began when we were selected to host the National NAACP Convention this July. And I want to thank one person here with us today that went for it. And he called me up and he said, I want to host the NAACP Convention in the city of Boston. And he went at it hot. And a lot of us are going to be on stages and giving speeches during that time. And, and the presidential campaign is going to be coming in here. But it's one person that we're thankful to, and that's Michael Curry. <laughs> this is the first time in 40 years that Boston is hosting this convention. We want it to be the greatest convention that the National NAACP ever holds. And we want the impact during that convention to last more than one week. We're going to use this opportunity as a catalyst to celebrate our city's progress, accelerate, the, accelerate that progress, and set an example for the nation. We're calling the year 2020 a year of black excellence to, our, to honor our history and set the stage for the future that's rooted in black achievement. Before I get into five signature events, I want people to think about for a minute what's happened from 40 years ago when the convention was in Boston to today. The victories, the defeats, the progress, the setbacks. Think of all of that that's happened in our city for the last 40 years. We have an opportunity now for the next 40 years to have victories, to have progress, to fight defeats, to eliminate setbacks. That's on us. That's on our generation to move forward. That's what's at stake. The older Bostonians that are here today, we stand on your shoulders. You are the folks that once for all the difficult times during civil rights and before that. It's on us, whether we're black or white or Latino or Asian, whether we're men or women, whether we're gay or we're straight, it's on us now to continue to move, move us forward as a city. We're going to have five signature events that right now, it's going to be more than five probably, but the five events are we're working with incredible partners including the Black Employee Network here at City Hall. And I want to thank you, in particular, the young people 
thank you very much for what you do in our city every single day. The Museum of African American History and Emerson College, to name a few, are going to be hosting events. If you don't know our city's history, I suggest you go to the African American Museum, the African Museum, to exactly see what our history is, to understand what the history of when I talk about the abolitionist movement of civil rights, what it actually means. Because we think we know it because we read about it in a chapter in a book. When we all went to school, we had a chapter, a few pages on it, and we think we know. We have no idea. We have no idea the history of the city. When Michael Curry talks at events, I hear him talk about people that I haven't heard of before that had, that had such a big impact on us as a country, not just as a city. It's important for us all to, to take part of this. You can learn about all these different events by visiting our website, and that's going live today. Boston.gov slash black dash excellence on our website today. Now it's time to recommit to civil rights and racial equity in our city and our country. We're going through an incredible time right now, a transformational time, if you will, in our country, and I can't stand here and with, with good faith and honesty and say, I like where we're going. I can't say that. Because when I flip on the TV and I flip on CNN, I see people talking about one group, one way we're going. I switch over to MSNBC, and I see us taking another different way. And then I flip over to, very quickly, Fox, and that's taking us another different way. And then I get the chance to hear young people on BET and different stations and hear people talk and see where we're going. We don't know where we're going. This is a pivotal year for America. It's a key moment between big political conversations, the national conversation, We'll be focusing right here in the, fo the conversation at the NAACP convention. Those conversations are important. It's about more than a presidential election. We have to restore America's soul. We have to rebuild America's moral compass. Those can't just be words on a piece of paper in a speech. That has to be reality. We have to do more. It's not about giving up here and giving a fancy speech. As I said at the MLK breakfast last week, I talked about we're on a panel, we're talking about all the great things, and I said, I figured what the question was, but my answer was, it's not just about saying the right thing today, it's about doing the right thing tomorrow. Tomorrow's today. And it's important for us to continue to move forward and move forward and, and, and continue to, to keep the conversations moving forward and changing where we are, who we are as a country. We have to get America back on the right path. Dr. King and the Civil Rights Movement put it on us. Dr. King loved this country. Dr. King knew this was the greatest country in the world. There's no question about it. Dr. King also knew that we were an imperfect union, that we have work to do. That work isn't done. That work will never be done. That work should never be done. But what we need to do is continue to make gains and not go backwards. We do this by learning and celebrating the rich history and the current contributions of our black community. Our guest of honor today exemplifies these contributions to his leadership in Boston. Cornell Brooks is a professor of public leadership and social justice at the Harvard Kennedy School. He grew up in South Carolina. I don't know if you, anyone's gone to South Carolina, but I had a chance to go to Columbia a couple weeks ago, actually a couple months ago. And the mayor is a good friend of mine, Steve Benjamin. And as I was driving through the city, it's low to a history. And that history is a tough history. And opened my eyes as I walked around where Starbucks is on the corner, I'm not sure what street it is, but understanding that that's where people were rounded up and they were sold into slavery. Today, it's a Starbucks. Understanding our history is so important. 
He went to school in Jackson State College in Mississippi. He earned a Master of Divinity degree from Boston University and a law degree from Yale University. He also ran for Congress. So he can deliver a sermon, argue a case, or give a stump speech, depending on the situation. His career is distinguished by servant leadership. He's been, se he's been senior counsel to the Federal Communications Commission, executive director of the Fair Housing Council of the Greater Washington, and president of the New Jersey Institute of Social Justice. And from 2014 to 2017, he served as the president and CEO of the national NAACP. So he's a very important guest here today for us to have this year in Boston as we embark on a year of black excellence. It's my honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Cornell William Brooks. Good afternoon. Now, as the mayor has mentioned, I'm a lawyer, but I'm also spent a fair amount of time in pulpits. And so as a consequence, I've grown unusually fond of what's called an antiphonal response. That is to say, a call and response. So if I say good afternoon, you need to say good afternoon, like not in Columbia, South Carolina, but rather you're in Boston, Massachusetts. So I'm going to say good afternoon, and I want to hear a long, loud, strong good afternoon. Loud enough for the people in South Carolina to hear. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Right, thank you. Thank you. First of all, let me just begin with the word, or two words, my very southern grandmother taught me to begin every sermon, every speech, every talk. Those words would be thank you. I came here many years ago, Mayor, Mr. Mayor, from Georgetown, South Carolina, a metropolis of about 10,000 people situated between Charleston and Myrtle Beach on the coast of South Carolina. I came to Boston after about 15 hours on a Greyhound bus with about $50 in my back pocket. So to stand in City Hall, having been welcomed to this podium as a graduate yes, of Yale Law School, but also of a head start. I remember where I came from, and I'm grateful for where I am. And I'm grateful to everybody in this hall this afternoon. I want to give a certain word of appreciation to Frida, who reached out to me uh, by letter by email and by Twitter to make sure I got here, Mr. Mayor. So that's just a pitch for her to get a, a, a raise or a bonus of, of some kind. I want to recognize the executive leadership team of the mayor, Madam President, the city council, your extraordinary staff who represent the sinew, the strength, the brilliance and brawn of this city, I want to recognize the three presidents, former presidents of the NAACP, the world's greatest civil rights organization. I want to recognize Michael Curry, whom I had an opportunity to work with at the NAACP. And can I let out a little secret? He, is a, he was, at that time, the second hardest working man in the NAACP. Can somebody somewhere put your hands together for Michael Curry? Now that choir, there's somewhere here, hopefully in this hall, I, I just want to share with you, uh, choir members, I found in the course of my travels that there are exactly two kinds of choirs, two kinds of good choirs. The first choir kind of choir makes speaking and preaching easier. The second kind of choir is so good, so extraordinary, so mellifluent, so resonant in their spiritual power, they make it more difficult to speak. 
And because I happen to follow you, I'm worried about that second kind of choir. Put your hands together for the choir and for our young people. We've assembled ourselves in this historic hall at this morally poignant moment in American history. We have assembled ourselves in this hall when our forebears, our foremothers, our forefathers are yet standing behind us and the future is before us, beckoning us to enter further into the 21st century. We find ourselves in this hall at this hour, at a historically resonant moment in American history. As the mayor has lifted up, we find ourselves in the midst of an hour of generationally unprecedented activism from one length, up, from one part of the country to the other. We find ourselves in a moment where many young people are questioning whether or not we can serve, whether or not we can stand together, whether, when the, whether or not we as a city can be Boston strong all year long through crisis, through struggle, through difficulty, through tumult, and come out together. This is a moment in which the way this city stands and stands together is critically important, not only for Roxbury, not only for Charlestown, not only for Cambridge, not only for Somerville, not only for Massachusetts, but for the whole of the country. Why? Because the nation is yet looking at Boston. I just want to lift up three themes for your consideration during this Black History Month. The first of which is, greatness is in their hands. Greatness is in their hands. The second theme is, consider the crown above our heads. And the third is, grow into greatness. Now, when I speak of greatness in their hands, I'm reminded of an enslaved young woman by the name of Phyllis Wheatley, whose mind was never enslaved, whose heart, whose gifts, whose God-given prodigious talent was never shackled. I'm reminded that this woman, whose books were transported on the same ship that transported the tea of the Boston Tea Party, I'm reminded that Phyllis Wheatley had greatness in her hands, holding greatness. I'm reminded that Prince Hall, an educator and an abolitionist, built a school, but not only did he build a school, he built the character of an enslaved people who refused to do anything but be free, he held the greatness of Boston in his hands. I'm reminded of the First Lady of Roxbury and the president of the historic Boston branch of the NAACP, Melnia Cass, who organized women to vote in the wake of the 19th Amendment, and she fought to desegregate Boston schools. Melnia Cass held greatness in her hands. I'm reminded of one of the foremost or the foremost intellectual of the 20th century, the founder of the NAACP, William Edward Burgat Du Bois, who wrote sociological studies, erudite history, stinging satire, enthralling romance, provocative pamphlets, academic papers, and he turned the rotation of the earth in the other direction toward justice. I'm reminded that Du Bois held greatness in his hands. But can I just come home? Can I just talk to you about everyday folk? I'm reminded of anything but anonymous, anything but nameless black families whose, old, whose names are not inscribed in history books. I'm reminded of black families 
who put pennies and prayers together to build houses of faith. I'm reminded of black families whose names are not found in the annals of history. I'm reminded of black families who build morality, who build character, who build brilliance, who make and write and create their own black history in our time in the city of Boston. I'm reminded. I'm reminded that these black families who constitute the pillars of our community hold greatness in their hands. I'm reminded that these black families are the same families that keep our city and our streets safe, who build our institutions, who take pennies and billions of dollars worth of determination to build businesses. I'm reminded of black immigrants who come from the islands, who come from the continent of Africa, who come from around the globe, and who come to this city and make it what it is. We don't have to be great again. We are great now. Our immigrants. Refugees from war, famine and difficulty come here and put their pennies together and they put their children in school, they put their workers forward and they make this city what it is. I'm reminded that our immigrants hold greatness in their hands. But can I tell you something? They're not the only ones who hold greatness. When I see the mayor's staff, when I see the employees of this city who keep the city clean, who keep the city safe, who represent the art and the culture and the cuisine of this city, when I'm reminded of the workers of Boston who hold greatness in their hands, I understand that history is not past, history is now, history is present, history is in our hands. But I suggested to you, the greatness is in their hands, but there's a crown above our head. There was a minister who was a mentor of a young man who came to become a theologian in the city of Boston. The student's name was the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. His mentor and professor was a man by the name of Howard Thurman. Howard Thurman talked about greatness and he described greatness this way. He said of his alma mater, Morehouse College, he said that every student had a crown above their head, Mr. Mayor, that they had to grow into Boston in 2020 has greatness in our hand, but we have a crown to grow into. The history of this city in 2020 may remind you that we have a near perfect bond rating. That's a crown of fiscal responsibility to grow into. The contemporary history may tell you that the mayor and his colleagues and citizens across the country, across the city, are investing $100 million in the schools. That's a history to grow into. The contemporary history may remind you that Boston ranks near the top or at the top in terms of open space, that we are enjoying a historic reduction in crime and arrest and dealing with police violence and violence on our streets. That's a history to be proud of and a crown to grow into. But can I tell you, we have to keep growing. You see, because I'm reminded of another Bostonian by the name of William Monroe Trotter, an architect of the NAACP. William Monroe Trotter, you remember school children that he was a first African-American member of Phi Beta Kappa and the first African-American Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Harvard. You 
be, you'll, be, you'll be reminded, you'll recall that, that William Monroe Trotter was a pioneer of the social justice strategies you see on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook. He had a, 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 a sit-in, if you will, at the White House when Woodrow Wilson insisted upon segregating the federal workforce. You, you recall that William Monroe Trotter conducted a film boycott against a Klan romanticist film. You recall that William Monroe Trotter was a pioneer of marching and demonstrating. You recall that William Monroe Trotter was an architect of social justice. William Monroe Trotter, Bostonian, started his social justice career by investing in real estate. In other words, he used business to bring about justice. So Mr. Mayor, I, I, I just wanna say that we have a crown to grow into in terms of contracting, in terms of economic development, in terms of increasing the net worth of black families, in terms of cre increasing the wealth and the intergenerational wealth of communities of color, we've got a crown to grow into because we will never be satisfied if any child goes to sleep hungry. We'll never be satisfied if any child goes to sleep on the street. We'll never be satisfied if any child is stunted and does not grow into the crown of greatness. Can I tell you, black history is being written as we speak. This is the time to be excited and enthralled by the possibilities that lie before us. And a few months hence, Boston will welcome the world's greatest civil rights organization, the NAACP. And when Boston comes here for the first time in 40 years, let the nation look at this city and recognize and realize that we're growing tall into this crown of greatness. We won't stop until black family wealth in Boston exceeds the nation and leads the nation. We won't stop until black businessmen and businesswomen have their fair share of contracts and lead the nation. That means we have to be aggressive. We have to do everything the law allows and everything that history demands. Because if William Monroe Trotter took capital and created social justice, what would happen if our contractors had their fair share in our time? Look across the expanse of this audience. We see people of every hue and every heritage, of every color and every complexion, of every pigmentation in this room. Let Boston lead the nation. Be clear, I came here as a young man with not a whole lot of money, but with many dreams. I came and got an extraordinary education in the city of Boston. I served at the Pine Street Inn working with the homeless. I preached in these churches. I baptized children in these churches. I was ordained in this city. My roots are in Boston and I never forgot. So I may not be a tall man, but I'm just gonna tell you, I'm trying to grow into that crown of greatness. Mr. Mayor, I can't speak to the height of everybody in this audience, but I can tell you this, those children want to grow into that crown of greatness. These students want to grow into that crown of greatness. These workers want to grow into that crown of greatness. Your staff wants to grow into that crown of greatness. These citizens want to grow into that crown of greatness, and we won't stop until that crown rests on our head when the NAACP comes to town. So be clear, the NAACP is not coming here for coronation. We're coming here to make sure our crown fits, and we're tall enough to wear it. Thank you.
And Professor, that was amazing, inspiring. Um, I don't know what else to say. Uh, we have a gift on behalf of all of the uh, employees here at City Hall for you. Uh, it's a Paul Revere Bowl. We want to thank you for being our speaker today. Uh, and that's be on behalf of all of us here, city councilors and everyone in this building, regardless of what they do for work, this is our gift to you. Thank you so much. Before I turn the mic back to John, I just want to introduce a few other people that are here, that were here, and they're around. Uh, City Council Julia Mejia was here. I think she might be in the back somewhere. Thank you, Council Mejia, for being with us. City Councilor Anissa Isabi George was here. Thank you, Council George. She's around here somewhere, too. Um, from the Boston Fire Department, I know he was here. Uh, Commissioner Joe Finn. Thank you, Commissioner Finn. And from the Boston Police Department, Superintendent Nora Bastian. Thank you, Superintendent, for being with us. And I quote, I might not be a tall man, but I'm trying to grow into my crown of greatness. That's, I'm, I'm, I'm more than a month. We're going we're gonna to sit on that, and we're going to all try to grow into our crown. So right this point, I want to ask the John D. O'Brien Varsity Choir to come in here and help us bring this program into an end and help us continue to grow into our crown. Let's hear it for the choir. Let's hear it. Bring them up. Bring them up. So we will continue, if you would allow us to. Um, one of my favorite genres of music to do with choirs is that is the Negro spiritual. Um, they are deep to my heart, and I believe they are to many of us sitting in this room today. And they tell a story of passion. They tell a story of, of anguish. They tell a story also of hope. And so I want to invite two of our students, Ms. Madeline Cosgrove and A.R. Spence, to lead us in Wade in the Water. It must 
must be the band Moses led. So we are going, thank you so much. So before we leave, I know that we are slated to sing, lift every voice and sing. So we did a little bit of a tweaking to this one. And then when we get to the end, I'm gonna invite all of you to join us if you know. All right, it. okay. So can we all sing that together? Lift every voice and sing.
God, let's hear it again for the John D. O'Brien Varsity Choir and Director Bradley. Amazing. So at this point, to close us out, I want to ask Pastor Reverend Gar uh, Gordon to come back up for a benediction. Let us pray once again. Heavenly Father, we give thanks for this day and this beautiful celebration where we celebrate the rich history and heritage of black people in this great city of Boston. We pray, God, that as we move forward as a community and as a city, that our mayor, that his staff, that all of our elected officials, our pastors, our community leaders and community activists would work together as all of us try to reach the crown that is above our head. Help us to move forth with the strength, passion, and purpose to reach the crown until all of our children grow up and have the best education here in this city. Help us to grow into that crown, God, until where every senior citizen will have the best of health insurance and health coverage. Help us to reach that crown where every young person, every millennial can buy a home here in this city and raise their family. Help us to reach that crown to all of our small businesses will be able to thrive because people have invested in them and they have invested into that community. Help us, God, to move forward to all of us where we can reach and grow into that crown where the nation is watching this city and where the nation will follow this city's leadership. We pray this, God, in your name. Amen.